deeper into prohibiting the making of images and idols. And it highlights the power and grave consequence of doing so. So in this one foul sweep, the children of God have managed to not just break the first, but also the second commandment. And they've done this before the commandments have even been given. I mean, I wonder, maybe there's some irony in that in, in itself. It maybe tells us something about the human, about human nature. Maybe that in itself is a cautionary tale at which we can stop. It's a little bit like, I suppose, when, uh, when a parent sort of uh, calls out the black sheep of the family to, to, to scare the kids, you know. You know, do, do you want to be like Cousin Leroy? You know, do you want to go to jail? No. Read your books and don't do drugs, you know. It's that, kind of, it's that kind of cautionary tale. It's kind of set out, and maybe that alone tells us something. But what I'd like us to do today is look at this commandment in a little bit, bit more detail. Because I think what God is inviting us to do is to look beyond what it prohibits us to do from doing and look to something a little bit deeper. So let's look at the command. First of all, it exclusively forbids the making of any image in heaven, on earth, under the sea, or in the sky, or any celestial being, stars, angels, all of that. It's all prohibited. It says, you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven and earth above. The second thing is it, it forbids the worship of these things. You shall not bow down and worship them. Are you following so far? Yeah. And then thirdly, it gives a warning of the grave consequence of doing so. It says, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So it's really clear. God makes it really clear. You're not to make stuff and you're not to worship it. You're not to bow down to it. Now, before I go too much further, I just want just, just to just point out a couple of things. If, if you have maybe come from uh, another religion in the past and you've come to faith, you might be looking at this and thinking, oh my goodness, are my children's children going to be cursed? Just to be clear, that's, that's not the way it works. The Bible makes really clear when you come to God, you are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has passed. So God is really good about and clear about that. But the other thing that I've noticed, I think that's important to say, is that you know, in our culture, there's a growing sort of maybe tendency towards things like pendants, charms, maybe crystals. And, and also in fashion, I don't know if you've noticed, there's, there's kind of been a move towards um, like symbolisms, you know, uh, sometimes pagan symbols, sometimes occultic symbols, and things that have just kind of become very prevalent in our culture. Now, these things aren't idols in themselves. But there's something about them that I kind of say they're almost like near neighbors. They're some, sort of some way connected. They're things that kind of hold in some way like a non, can hold a non-earthly power. And sometimes things that we can align ourselves to that aren't really what God wants. And I think that these are things that we need to bear in mind as we think about this idea of idols. So, just from the surface of this teaching, there's a few things that God wants to show us. The first thing is this, idol worship is progressive. It starts by what we make, and then by what we bow down to, and then by what we worship. There's a progression there that happens. The second thing is that idol worship is contagious. You know, this, this, the, the, God says it really clearly, you know, there's an impact, a negative impact from generation to generation. The third thing that it shows us is this, it's that God is really zealous and deeply committed to being worshipped as he deserves. His jealousy in this case is right and righteous because it's inflamed by the denial of what rightfully belongs to him. But in contrast, at the same time, we see that God's restrained judgment of the wicked we also see that his abundant steadfastness to those who love him and that he pours out his love on those who are obedient. So, by and large, we could probably look at this commandment as a church and we could kind of go, I mean, probably, I, I don't know what's in your house or how you're living, but generally speaking, it's easy peasy, you know. Basically, don't make anything or paint anything or carve anything and then don't worship anything that is made, painted or carved. 
fairly straightforward. We can all do that. We're all good. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Can we all agree on that, please? <laughs> That T-shirt. <laughs> the thing is that, that actually God is inviting us in this commandment to look a bit deeper. He's commanding us, he's inviting us to look closer and examine ourselves more deeply. This commandment presses us to recognize truth from falsehood. Accurate images from inaccurate ones. And ultimately, it invites us to look at the difference between image management versus image bearing. And we're going to break each of those things down and look at them now. So the first thing is this, image management. You know, in our society, our politicians and leaders go to great lengths to create an image and curate an image of themselves that represents power. And they... Choose what they wear and how they wear it, wear it and how they are seen. And it's kind of to create a mask to hide behind and to hold that illusion of power. But our heavenly ruler's take is completely different. In order to preserve the reality of his perfection, God decrees that no human conceived image of him shall be made. Because all it will do is cloud and diminish our understanding of who he really is. So how do you convey truly a God who is infinite and invisible with something like paint or wood or clay that is finite? There's no way that you're going to do it justice. You're only going to make God look bad. The level of misrepresentation is a little bit like this. It's a bit like if you had to get your passport renewed. Instead of going to a photographer, you call a five-year-old and give them some watercolors and tell them to paint a picture of you. That's the level of misrepresentation. There's no scenario in which that's going to go well for you. You know, you're going to get to the airport and they're going to detain you, you know? But that's the level of misrepresentation that we're talking about. God is basically saying, just don't do it. You're not going to get it right. You're not going to do me justice. And then what's going to happen, if you remember Israel, is then you're going to end up bowing down to it and worshipping it as if it was me, and it's not me. It's nothing like me. It's not even close. Don't do it. So I've got a little equation, I think, that's going to come up, hopefully, now. I wonder if there are any scientists amongst us or mathematicians amongst us that can tell us what that equation is. Give us a guess. Out loud. What's the first symbol? I'm not getting... I'm, I, do you know what? Do you know, I'll just tell you. <laughs> this week, I actually can't hear out of this ear. I can only hear out of this one. So the whole time in my house, I've been going, what, you know, what to speak in this ear? Speak in this ear. Approximation, thank you. <laughs> Somebody put their hand up. He, he knows. He knows. He knows. The first symbol is approximate. Similar to is not greater than equal to. Similar to is not greater than equal to. The second thing that we want to look at in this commandment is understanding that the, the, the separation of what is accurate and inaccurate images. In Exodus, the account of the golden calf, have you ever wondered how it is that Aaron is so complicit in what seems to be an obvious and evident moment of idolatry? Aaron, the guy next to Moses, seems to go along with this whole thing. And, it, and, and it's a little bit bonkers. But the reason is, when you look at it, there's actually something quite nuanced that happens here. Let's just look at verse 5. If you've got your Bible, just turn it. We'll get the, the scripture back up. So verse 5. Is it there? The number of things? Oh, sorry. You're, you're asking which scripture. Verse 5 of where, Prince? Be helpful. Tell us where. 
Verse 5 of Exodus 32. So it's just back to Mount Sinai. So, it says this. Tomorrow there will be a feast to who? To the Lord. This is, this is Aaron speaking. He says tomorrow, and, and he's looking at the calf when he says this. So just picture it in your eye. He's looking at the calf and he says to the people, tomorrow we are going to have a feast to the Lord. And the Hebrew term that he uses here is Yahweh. So he's very clearly thinking about God. So what's happening here? What's going on is something quite significant. See, what's happened is Aaron and the people of God have got caught up in believing a lie. And this is the most dangerous and the most subtle type of lie. It's the lie that God, it's the lie that something less than God is God. Is that clear? It's the lie that something less than God, this calf, is actually God. This is what is going on in, in Aaron's mind and in the people of God's mind. And it seems odd, but actually, if you think about it, it's not that unusual. See, the sin of idolatry isn't just to worship a different God. It's actually the lie that leads us to make a version of God that is less than who he truly is. And then after we make it, we bow down to it. And after we bow down to it, we worship it. Any image of God that we hold in our hearts and in our minds that is less than what God truly is, is an idol. And it's very easy for us to get lost in that. So, if the mannequin wasn't enough of an illustration, let me present it to you in a different way. If I asked James Hunting, come up, James. If I asked him to come up, he, he's, he's not aware what's going on. He's thinking, what's going on here? Let's just, just turn around quick, James. If I said to you, if I asked you who is, if, if, if you asked me, sorry, who is James Hunting? And I said, James is a white man with a nice smile and blue eyes. Is that true? Yes. How rude. Yes. He's a white man with a nice smile and he's got blue eyes. No, that's not. I've got another. Okay. So, could you say that I've just told you the truth about James's identity? Hands up for yes. Hmm. Hands up for no. Okay. No. Of course I've not. I've not told you the truth about James's identity. What I've... Just beg. Yeah. Great sense of humour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Give us the rest. Come He's good looking. Like Great sense Chris. of... Well, I think we should hear it from your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. Please sit down. Thank you. I've not told you... I've told you something about James's identity, and, it, and it's true, but it's different to the truth about who James is. Do you get me? So it's easy to, if, if you pick a couple of qualities and attributes, and we say, this is what James is, that might be true, but it's not the truth of who James is. If I was describing James, and that was the, his epitaph, that was everything that I said about him at the end of the days, I would have done him a complete misservice and a complete injustice. And that is what the issue is with idolatry. Does that make sense? So let me put this in a different way. In the case of Yahweh and the calf, let's just look at the, the grandeur of the, uh, of the enormity of the lie. See, the calf is small. God is immense. The calf is inanimate, but God is spirit. It is location bound, but God is everywhere and fully present. It is created, but God is eternal. He knows no beginning and he knows no end. It is impotent, but God is omnipresent and omnipotent. 
It is destructible, but God is indestructible. It is of minor value, but God is of infinite value. It is blind, deaf, and mute, but God sees, hears, and he speaks. Simply put, the golden calf is a lie about who God is. And here we find God's people, the children of Israel, worshipping a golden calf. You see, the actual challenge was this, that Israel had just come out of Egypt and they were on their way to Canaan. And there's something that we have to understand about the culture here that informs our understanding of how we can be maybe led into the same lie potentially. See, in Egypt, the main god, lower case G, was Apis and he was a mighty bull god. Now, in Canaan, the highest and mightiest deity was a bull god, release shift, don't press caps lock, it's lowercase, was a bull god called El. So you see that the worship of bulls was all the rage in the region. Now, what Aaron does is this. He creates for the people of Israel a Yahweh of his own imagination. And look what he does. He he shapes it, he forms it as a calf. What is a calf? Sorry, louder, I can only hear from this here. It's a baby bull. So you've got Epsis, you've got Apsis, and you've got El, who are the, the pagan gods. And they are these mighty, you know, fierce bulls, these mighty fierce creatures. But when Aaron makes a Yahweh of his own imagination, he creates it as a tame, little, baby, knobbly-kneed calf. So what he's done is he's basically taken the things of the culture. He's taken the gods of the age, and he's formed his idea of God as a blend of those two things. And he's reduced God down to something that is impotent and something that is small and something that is less than who God really is. And you see, when we take on, when we try to shape and form for ourselves, um, when we shape and form for ourselves an image of who God is that is not fully informed by him and his word, what we do is we take references from our culture and what we end up creating is an image that is less than and smaller than who God is. So what might this look like for us? So in the book that this series is um, drawn from, there's a couple of references that I think are really, really helpful and I'm just going to kind of read through them. So the first thing is, Maybe when we think about the prosperity gospel. We, of course, as believers, would never worship wealth, right? We know that that's not what the Bible tells us to do. We wouldn't go chasing after things that we know don't satisfy. We wouldn't be like our maybe non-Christian neighbours. But yet, we can easily form Yahweh into a safe, and benevolent form of mammon. And when our money is tight, we ask, what is the lack of faith that has held God's abundance from me? And when our account is full, we say, ah, this is because of my great faith and I've pleased God and so he's blessing me. We can end up thinking that there's a transactional thing that happens and we make this God that works on our transactional basis. Or maybe if we think about what you might call a works-based salvation. You know, we can reject the idea from these other religions that, you know, you need to work your way towards God. We know that, you know, salvation is by grace and it's by faith. You know, we know that. So we'd never be like those other religions. But what we can sometimes in our walk do is fashion a transactional slot machine version of God. And when we pull the levers with our well-worded prayers in Jesus' name, he is obliged 
to reward us with blessings for our wise choices. And when things are going tough, we ask ourselves, God, what have I done to deserve this? And when things are going great, we say, well, God must be blessing me for my obedience. It's not a true image of who God is, but sometimes it's the image that maybe we find ourselves working with. The final one is this, is this idea of a pick and mix approach to God, to the God of the Bible. You know, we take the qualities of God that are maybe most palatable to us, the things that we're most comfortable with. You know, we're comfortable to talk about a God of love. You know, we worship a God of love, but we forget that he's also a God of wrath. You know, we talk about maybe uh, that he's a God of grace, but we fall silent when it comes to talking about God's justice. Or maybe we just pick and choose our favourite member of the Trinity and we focus our worship, our singing, our praise and adoration on them and forget about the other two. And in so in this way, we kind of turn God into a puppet to our own ends. So what's the application of all of this? How can this knowledge shape our lives? How can we... Uh, turn our thinking towards uh, really understanding and recognizing and cultivating a true image of who God is so that we don't uh, get lost unintentionally into following idols. Well, this commandment is clear in telling us what we shouldn't do. But when we look slightly beyond it, what begins to come into focus is what it encourages And what we find is that though we're not to create idols, there is a bit of carving and chiseling that we have to do. See, the golden calf truly tells a lie. It's a false teacher, and it reveals to us God diminished. And the only way we can spot false teaching is to know the truth. God has chosen to reveal himself through Scripture. We can know who God is by being constant and consistent in studying God's word and really looking through it to understand, God, what are you like? God, what have you said about yourself? God, who are you? And so being in God's word, whether it's by reading or with an app or with a day-to-day devotion or by listening to it, whatever, is so important that we return back to the word of God for our understanding of who who God is, and that we we check our own selves. What is the picture I have of God? When we say things, when we think things about God, we have to ask ourselves, hold on, is, is what I'm saying, is what I'm thinking in line with who God is? So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that the other way God has chosen to reveal himself, the other way that we can know the truth of who God is and be clear about that from a lie is that God has chosen to reveal himself through image bearing, okay? Colossians 1.15 tells us this. Colossians 1.15 says, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the undiminished image bearer of God. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. If you want to know how God thinks, look at Jesus. If you want to know how God feels about you, feels about humanity, feels about the weak, the broken, the lost, feels about just about anything, look at what Jesus does. Look at who Jesus is. He is the undiminished bearer of God's image. So to be clear that there is nothing that is made by human hands, or by human wisdom or human skill that can properly bear the image of God. But there is another creation. It's a creation of God's wisdom and skill that does bear the image of God. I just want you to turn quickly with me to Genesis 1. We're just going to look at this really quick together as we come into land. Genesis 1 And we're going to read verses 26 and 27. It's going to come up on the screen. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our likeness, 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So, who here is making an image of God? Who? God. God is making an image of himself. Because God is the only person who's allowed to do that. We've established that. Because he's going to do it justice. We're five-year-olds. We're going to get it wrong. We're not going to get our passport. Okay? God is the only person. But this is the thing. In whom does he place that image? Not himself. In us. In you. God has placed an image of himself in you. I, uh, years ago, my son, Micah, was um, at a sports day, and he was running his little race. It was, I don't know, it was 100 metres. And so, at that stage, Micah wasn't a great runner. In fact, what I'll say is that he ran with his face faster than he ran with his feet. So the look on his face when he was running was like... <laughs> and there was more going on up here than was going on down there. But he would run like mad. And on this particular race... He was actually, like, properly winning. He was properly winning. And I stood up, and I went, whose child is that? Oh, it's my child! Come on, my car! <laughs> my child, my image. You are God's child, and he has chosen to use you to bear his image. And he's going, come on, son! Come on, daughter. Yeah, go for it. You can do it. Amazing. Come on. I want you to show the world how great I am. And so I don't want you to make images that look like me. I want you to be like me. Hmm? We're not to carve and make things. We are, we are the image. And so... What does that mean for us? You know, when we realize, hold on. Oh. Oh, you, 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 you're looking at me to understand who God is. Oh, okay. So when you're dealing with your difficult neighbor who won't do their bit, when you're on the U3, and you've got the kids effing and jeffing. <laughs> oh, you're looking at me. When somebody cuts you up on the road, when somebody cuts you up, you're on the, you're, 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 they cut you up on the road, and you're like, ah! Oh, yeah. You're looking at me to show people who God is, right? When we meet people or work with people or engage with people who just seem really difficult to love or really difficult to understand, you're looking at me to show you who God is. Just for, just for the record, that scripture says that God puts his image on the church. On who? Us, the church, or does it go further than that? Humankind. God doesn't just bear his image on us. He bears it on every human being. So those lads that are effing and jeffing, yeah, them as well. You know, the communities in our society that we find it hard to love, that we kind of ostracize, that we're like, ah, them as well. They bear God's image. It speaks to us about how we operate, how we engage, how we connect, how we see others. But the truth is that, yes, we do, all of us, all humankind, bear God's image. But the reality is it's in a diminished sense because that's what sin does to us. There is only one who truly, perfectly bears the image of God. And so when we look at Jesus, and I'm coming into land, 
When we look at Jesus, when we gaze on him, guess what happens? We become more like him. We become more like him and so we can show the world more clearly who God is. Galatians 5, and I'm going to ask the band if you could come up. Galatians 5 describes to us the fruit of the Spirit. It tells us what the Spirit of God at work in us begins to do. And it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we're not to chisel and make out of wood, but we have got some internal carving to do. The heart of the second commandment is not that we just stop making and worshipping things that look like God, but it's that we realise that God is inviting us to reflect more clearly his image, that he has chosen to reveal Christ and reveal him through us. Let's stand together and worship in response. So as we sing, this song in itself is a response, but I just wonder, you know, God is at work here today. He's speaking into your heart. I just wonder, is it a moment maybe for us to invite a fresh the Holy Spirit, because it's him that does the chiseling. It's him that does the transforming. The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, births fruit. He, tra- he transforms us. So what we, what we want to do is not just try to fix ourselves. We, we, know, we, we know that's we can't really do that. But, but the Holy Spirit, when we invite him in, we say, come, come, Spirit of God. You are the reflect, perfect reflection of God. Come into our hearts. Come and transform us. Come and change us. When we wait on him, that work happens. So as we worship now, let's invite him afresh and let's wait.
Yeah, God, I thank you that you are not a transactional God. Yeah, that you, God, have moved us, that you have saved us, that you have transferred us from death to life. That Jesus, you have paid for our sins. And that will forever will be our plea. God, we pray that you help us to look to you and you only. Yeah, God, that we wouldn't make an idol out of anything in this earth or just part of who you are. But enlarge our vision of you. God, day by day, we pray that you may help us to better follow after you, to better reflect you. I thank you that you love us as we are and not as we should be, but not enough to leave us as we are. Help us, we pray, to follow more dearly after you. Today, tomorrow, and in the days and weeks to come, We're going to draw a line there. And if you have kids, please uh, can you go, can you honor our kids' workers and go collect them. But if anything that Prince has said today has stirred you, we'd love to pray with anyone or anything else that's happened today's service, then please come forward. There'll be a bunch of people at the front here to do so. And if you're a student, please don't rush off. We'd love to feed you lunch. If you hang out on the hallway, I'm sure someone will tell you about how to get there. God bless you. Have a great week. See you soon. Thank you.